We're going to start Unit 4 by taking a look at Section 1, which is about physical versus chemical changes. Now, you've probably learned about these before in other science classes, but this is something that you need to know about in AP Chemistry as well. A physical change is essentially when a material undergoes a type of change that doesn't affect its chemical composition. So that might include something like just changing something's appearance or its shape or its size, something like taking a piece of paper and tearing it up or folding it or taking an object and moving it from one place to another. These are all physical changes. Uh, things such as phase changes like a melting or boiling or freezing or condensation, sublimation, these are phase changes where all you're doing is changing from one state of matter to another, like solid to liquid or liquid to gas. And these are just physical changes as well. All we're doing is uh, moving or rearranging the molecules. We aren't actually changing the molecular structure itself. On the other hand, chemical changes are when you take one or more substances and actually convert them into new substances. So that would include things like burning or oxidizing or rusting or digesting. Now, when you see a chemical reaction, there are often some very telltale signs that a chemical reaction has taken place. Things like a color change. So if you see something that changes from um, colorless to pink, for example, that's a sign that a chemical reaction has taken place. That color change tells you that. A change in odor. If all of a sudden you start smelling something uh, that smells rather unusual that you hadn't smelled before, probably a sign of a, of a chemical reaction that had taken place. Change in texture. Uh, if something, for example, if you take a piece of paper and burn it, perhaps that paper was nice and smooth before, and then after it's burned, it's all a brittle. Well, that's a sign of a chemical reaction because of change in texture there. Production of light. We often see that in the form of a flame, but it can be in some other forms as well, a bioluminescence or a chemoluminescence as well. Those are signs of a chemical reaction. Production of heat. If you take a flame, you know that if you stick your hand next to that, you're going to feel some heat. Uh, once again, sign of a chemical reaction. Production of a gas. That may be in the form of uh, bubbles. It may be in the form of smoke. But once again, a sign of a reaction. Producing a precipitate. A precipitate is a solid that's formed from the mixture or the combination of two or more solutions. And so a precipitate, yeah, that's a sign of a chemical reaction. Normally, uh, you'll see two or more of these things in a chemical reaction. Often, uh, I think intuitively, we kind of know that these things tell us that a reaction has taken place. If you have a sandwich, for example, and you put that in the refrigerator and then leave it there for a month and come back, you may find that the sandwich has changed color. Maybe it was... Uh, Perhaps the, uh, the bread was white and now it's, it's green. And maybe the odor has changed. It doesn't smell very good. And the texture has changed. Maybe it's not nice and fluffy bread, but maybe it's slimy now. Uh, and maybe there are even the bubbles being formed. There. Well, intuitively, you know that a reaction has taken place and you really shouldn't eat that sandwich. So these are signs of a chemical reaction. Now, we're going to move right into section two here in unit four and this is about the actual solubility rules and how we, we talk about reactions and equations. Now we can talk about chemical reactions with just words if we really want to. We can use this sentence here to talk about a reaction and say aluminum, metal, and oxygen gas react to produce solid aluminum oxide and that would be perfectly fine. However, it's more common to write this in terms of a chemical equation where we use symbols. So we've seen some symbols like this before in this course already where we use chemical symbols for elements and chemical formulas in the place of compounds as well as some symbols like plus which means and or added to and the arrow which means yields. And we can use some uh, symbols inside parentheses to represent different states of matter, like S for solid and G for gas. 
Uh, AQ for aqueous, if that were there, means dissolved in water. L for liquid. Now, that's a, a very nice chemical equation, but one thing we need to obey whenever we write a chemical equation is the law of conservation of mass. That means that the numbers of an element on the left side of the equation needs to be equal to the number of atoms of that element on the right side of the equation. And as you can see, that's not really happening here. Like for example, we have two oxygen atoms and we have three oxygen atoms on the other side. We have to balance that. And we do that by placing coefficients in front of the substances. So in the case of oxygen, if we could multiply this by two, by putting a two in, right there in that spot, and then multiply this one by three, well now we have six oxygen atoms on both sides. And so the oxygen atoms are balanced now. Of course, we have to do the same thing for the aluminum atoms. We only have one aluminum atom on the left side, but we have four, you know, two times two is four, on the right side. So we have to multiply that left aluminum by four, and now we have a balanced equation. So whenever you write an equation, make sure that you go ahead and do that extra step and balance the equation. Now, when we look at equations and reactions in AP Chemistry, we're going to find that most of the reactions that we deal with are in solution. That means that it's often not going to be elements that are reacting, but rather it's ions that react. Because as we've already said in this course, if you take an ionic compound and dissolve it into water, all of a sudden you have ions swimming around. And that's what's going to react. That aqueous solution acts as a better uh, conduit for the reaction to take place. So let's take a look at how different substances dissolve. Now, as we've already said in this course, water is the universal solvent. That means if you have enough water and enough time, most things are going to dissolve in water eventually. Now, you need to know some of the solubility rules for ionic compounds because this will help you to write equations as we move into the next part here in section two. Now, the first rule, this, in fact, these first two rules are probably the most important ones of all. The first one is that all nitrates are soluble. That means that if you see a compound that ends with NO3, that nitrate, it is going to dissolve in water. So that's a nice rule, not really in ex any exceptions to speak of. All nitrates are soluble. And we can say the same thing about compounds that have alkali metal ions. That would be things like lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium ions. And the ammonium ion, those are always going to be soluble as well. And so uh, if you take a look at any compound, if it has an alkali metal ion on the front of it, or an ammonium, it will dissolve in water. Once again, not really any uh, exceptions to that rule as far as I can tell, as far as I know anyway. And so those are uh, a couple of excellent rules. In fact, you can probably get through uh, most, if not all, of AP Chemistry by just knowing those two rules, those solubility rules. They write the AP exam in such a way that you don't really have to know the others. But uh, if you're serious about learning chemistry, you really do need to know the other solubility rules as well. Because if you're planning on going into chemistry uh, and you don't know these solubility rules, uh, they're going to maybe laugh you out of the classroom. I don't know. But you need to know some of the others. Like acetates are soluble. Compounds that end with that acetate ion. You see anything at all, even lead or mercury, but it's acetate, it is going to dissolve in water. So those are some nice rules there. Here's another one. Uh, the nice thing about those first three rules is, is that as far as I know, there are no exceptions. These upcoming rules here do have some exceptions. All chlorides, all bromides, and all iodides are soluble in water. And there are some exceptions to that. Silver, lead, and mercury. So if you see silver chloride, that's, that's an exception. That's not going to dissolve in water. Or lead uh, two iodide. Once again, that's not going to dissolve in water. But, but pretty much every other chloride, bromide, or iodide that you could come up with, those are, for the most part, going to dissolve in water. Sulfates are also soluble almost all the time. Notice that there are six sulfates that are not soluble. They are silver sulfate, lead sulfate, mercury one sulfate, calcium sulfate, 
strontium sulfate, and barium sulfate. So once again, three of your six exceptions are the same exceptions that you had up here, silver, lead, and mercury. So those, it seems like those silver, lead, and mercury compounds for some reason don't dissolve in water quite as well as the others. Notice that the other three, calcium, strontium, and barium, those are your heavier group two elements. And so maybe you can remember those as you look at your periodic table on the left side there toward group two, kind of toward the bottom. Those are some of your exceptions. Those are your, your, your insoluble sulfates that you have to know. Now, these next few rules are for substances that, generally speaking, don't dissolve in water, like chromates. Generally speaking, chromates do not dissolve in water, unless, of course, they happen to be alkali metals and ammonium chromates, because those, those ions always dissolve in water. But other chromates are not going to dissolve in water. Phosphates are the same way. Phosphates, generally speaking, do not dissolve in water, unless, of course, you have alkali metals or ammonium on the front of it. Same thing with carbonates. Carbonates don't dissolve in water either, unless you have those alkali metals or ammonium on the front of there. So chromates, phosphates, carbonates, generally speaking, do not dissolve in water. And then here's another one that's quite important to know, hydroxides. Usually hydroxides do not dissolve in water. And the only exceptions are group one and your heavier group two. So your alkali metal hydroxides, of course, on the left side of the table, and then your heavier group two hydroxides like barium, strontium, and calcium. And you might remember from uh, an earlier lesson I believe that was uh, in an earlier unit, we said that those hydroxides, in fact, those are there are basically only eight hydroxides that are, are soluble, if you look at the exceptions there. Uh, those are your strong bases. And so the strong bases are uh, essentially the same as your soluble hydroxides. So that's kind of an interesting rule there to go along with solubility. Now, like I said before, uh, it's important to know these because this is going to help us to write net ionic equations as we move into the next video here in this next part of section two. But let's just do some practice here. Which of these compounds are soluble in water? So let's start with the sodium perbromate. Now, hopefully your eyes kind of kind of move over toward the sodium and you realize that since there's an alkali metal ion there, that has to be soluble in water. So yes, that is going to dissolve. And how do we know? Well, there's a sodium right there. All alkali metal ions and those compounds are going to dissolve. How about the barium phosphate? Once again, your eyes hopefully will gravitate toward the phosphate. And you'll see that, yeah, you know, for the most part, phosphates do not dissolve in water. So that one is insoluble. How about the iron 3 chromate? Once again, you might remember the rule for chromates. And we said chromates, generally speaking, are not soluble. So those do not dissolve in water. How about gold 3 chloride? Well, chlorides do dissolve in water, don't they? Now, there are only three exceptions to that rule, silver, lead, and mercury. And this is not one of those three. So gold 3 chloride is soluble in water. Next, we have a barium nitrate. Well. The very first rule we saw was that all nitrates are soluble. So yes, barium nitrate is going to dissolve in water. Mercury 1 sulfate. Now we said that sulfates generally were soluble, but this was one of those six exceptions, wasn't it? So yeah, that one's not going to dissolve in water at all. What about aluminum bromide? Well, our eyes once again should gravitate toward the bromide. We said that all bromides are soluble. Right? except for silver, lead, and mercury. And this is not one of those exceptions, so this is certainly going to dissolve into water. And so we have some practice there. Now you might be wondering, why should we care about this? Why is it important to know the solubility rules? Well, as we write these net ionic equations in the next couple of videos, you're going to find that soluble ionic compounds exist as separate ions in water solution. That means that those uh, ions are going to dissociate. And so you'll have separate ions swimming around in the water solution in order to make a reaction. On the other hand, insoluble compounds, those 
Those don't dissolve, that means they do not dissociate, they just sink down to the bottom of the beaker and they exist as complete compounds in water solution. So what that means is if you have something like sodium nitrate, this is a soluble compound, isn't it? It's going to dissolve in water. All nitrates are soluble and that alkali metal tells us that too. So that means that since it's soluble, it's going to dissociate into its ions. And in solution, you're going to have sodium ions and nitrate ions swimming around in solution. Likewise, if you have copper 2 sulfate, well, that's soluble because most sulfates are soluble, aren't they? They're going to dissolve. That means that when you take this substance and dissolve it in water, what you're going to have will be copper ions swimming around in solution and sulfate ions swimming around in solution. That way, you know, those will be available for perhaps a, re a chemical reaction. Now, if you have this compound right here, silver chloride, this is not soluble, is it? You know, most chlorides are soluble, but this is one of those three exceptions. So guess what? It's not going to dissolve. It's not going to dissociate. It just sinks down to the bottom of the beaker and remains as AgCl, silver chloride, solid. It is insoluble. So I hope you have uh, learned here about the solubility rules. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you got something out of this, please uh, smash that thumbs up button and keep watching because in our next couple of videos, we're going to find some applications here and we're going to see how we can uh, write net ionic equations using these solubility rules. I'm Jeremy Krug. Thanks for watching.